Next, we're going to incorporate a different kind of forcing term that comes in handy in a lot of modeling situations. It's called the unit step function, or it's also known as the heavy side function. We're going to use capital H of T to denote the heavy side function, and its graph is just a simple step up. So it's zero for negative values of T and one for positive values of T. The idea behind a step function is that it represents a switch. If you wanted to switch on at a time other than zero, let's say at capital T, then you would just use H of T minus capital T. So that's zero before the switch and one after the switch. There's a key fact about using these as forcing functions in ODEs. So the solution of our first order linear ODE with a step input provided the coefficient function and this f of t are themselves continuous, then the solution is also continuous at all times. Here's a solution procedure when you have step functions in the forcing. Fun in the forcing. We're going to use a constant coefficient a here, and we're going to assume these k1, k2, and so on are all constants as well. So this is actually a piecewise constant forcing. Our approach is going to be sort of a divide and conquer. So we'll first solve a homogeneous problem with the correct initial value. And then we'll solve another problem with the same equation, but just one of the step, uh, one of the step terms as the forcing function at a zero initial condition. And then the next one will solve it for the next step with a zero initial condition and so on. So if we call a solution to the first one, let's say that's xh, and the next one is the solution is x1, and the next one the solution is x2, etc. Then we'll let x be the sum of all those. So xh plus x1 plus x2, as many as we have. Well, it follows because of linearity. First of all, the initial value is correct because only the first one contributes. And second of all, since the ODE is linear, when we apply the linear operator to x, then that's just the sum of the operator applied to all the individual pieces. So the first one, when we apply the operator, gives zero because of how we defined it. x1, when we apply the operator, gives the first step function, and so on. So each one brings in one of those individual steps. So this x is the sum of the original problem. This is called the method of superposition. Now to finish the job, we have these two different types of problems to solve, the homogeneous one and the step. The homogeneous one is easy. We've done this a million times already. So it's just e to the at times x0. For this other problem, we'll just think of it piecewise. 
for times less than capital T1, the forcing term is just zero. And for times greater than capital T1, it's the constant K1. Now in this problem, we're starting from zero and the forcing is zero for a while. So X just stays at zero all the way up to time capital T1. After that time, we've got a constant forcing. So the solution has the homogeneous part and a particular solution, which in this case is just an unknown constant. Put in the particular solution, and we find out that the constant has to be negative k1 over little a. So the solution to this subproblem has to be c1 times e to the at minus k1 over a. Now we use the initial condition at time t1 for this part of the solution. So we know the solution is 0 at t1, and that tells us how to find c1. So now we know this x1. It's 0 before t1, and it's equal to this after t1. So when we put that together, the initial part of 0 and then this, we can write the whole thing in one shot by using a step function again. So we just multiply by a switch turning on at time t1. So now we have x1. We already found the xh. If we had more terms, we would put in, find x2, x3, but they all look essentially like x1. Here's an example. We're going to solve with a forcing function that is 5 between times 3 and 6, and 0 everywhere else. Wt is really a windowing function. In other words, it's just a constant value between two times. And we can write it in terms of two-step functions like this. One that turns on at time 3, and another that turns off at time 6. That means we can solve this in three parts, the homogeneous part with the initial value, That's just negative 2 e to the t over 10. Then we have the solution for the first step term with a 0 initial condition. And I just found that in the previous segment. So that's just x1 of t equals k1 over a times h of t minus t1 times e to the a t minus t1 all minus 1. So that was the first part, the second part, and then the third part is just due to the other step function and it looks exactly analogous to x1.
So the solution to the original problem is just the xh plus the x1 plus the x2. I want to redo that last example with the step forcing numerically. The only thing I'm going to do is change the problem slightly um, in order to make a nicer picture, really. I'm just changing the coefficient that used to be 1 here. I'm just making it 1 tenth instead. So the first piece of the solution goes from time 0 to time 3. I have to define the differential equation for the numerical solution. So remember, I define a differential equation by creating a function that says what dx dt must be. So dx dt as a function of t and x is 0 0.1 times x. I'm going to solve this at 200 points in the interval from time 0 to time 3. And then in my solver, I have to give it the f, the time, and the initial value. So I'll do that and plot the solution. Now that the solution's done, this ta is now a vector of 200 times from 0 to 3, and xa is a vector of 200 solution values at those same times. All right, in the second piece, now the forcing term is turned on. So I have this plus 5 here. So that reflects, or that has to be reflected in this definition for the differential equation here. I want to solve this piece at time, times between 3 and 6. And then specifying the initial value for this segment is a little bit tricky because mathematically what I want is the value of the solution xa at the time t equals 3. And if we were writing that on paper, we would write xa parentheses 3. But in this program, that would be the third element of a vector v or of a vector xa. That's not what I want because that would be some early time close to zero. Instead, what I want is the value of the solution that corresponds to t equals three, which is at the very end of the vector. Right? That was the very last thing we asked for in the first part. So here is the syntax for getting the last element of that solution vector from the previous segment. And when I look at the solution, it's continuous as it's supposed to be. But you notice x prime is definitely not continuous. The slope has a discontinuity, which actually makes sense because the original differential equation tells you that x prime is equal to something, which is continuous, that's x, plus a jump from 0 to 5 and back again. So since x prime was defined to have a jump in it, it's not surprising that the slope jumps. In fact, it should be jumping by 5. Finally, in the last segment, I'm back to the homogeneous equation, so I define that again. And it, could, it starts at time 6. It could go on forever, but I have to tell MATLAB where to stop, so I'll stop it at time 10. And now the initial condition comes from the second segment of the solution, but again, it's the last value in that segment, which is at time 6. And there I have the complete solution.